Hi, this is Lady Lex UK and this is Deconstructing Dreams. Uh, this is another audience request. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at Mad GFX Snags uh, Chainsaw. Uh, this was part of a duel, if you like, between him and John Beach during the beta. Um, they started off doing medieval uh, weaponry and they both made a crossbow and then they went to power tools. Uh, Mad GFX made this fantastic chainsaw and John Beach made, I think, a drill, um, if I remember rightly. Anyway, um, it doesn't matter who won. Uh, they both won because they both created some amazing things. Um, however, uh, this is uh, the chainsaw that we're going to be looking at today. And um, it only has 281 thumbs up. And I'm going to add to that right now. 282 thumbs up, I don't believe... Um, I watched this on Twitter and liked it on there and then never actually looked at it in dreams. I think that's what has gone on here. Anyway, um, the problem with this, I feel, is that there are no tags and no description and there's nothing in here that says chainsaw. So if you're looking for a, a nice chainsaw to look at, um, you're never going to find this. So snags, if you're watching this, um, add a tag or do something so that um, the word chainsaw appears somewhere. Otherwise, people aren't going to find your fantastic sculpture. Anyway, let's have a look and see what he made. So here is the chainsaw. It's hyper-realistic, um, beautifully um, presented in the dark here with a reflective table. So it's got the whole thing. It's got a great big long power cable on there. It looks real. It looks incredibly real. Um, if uh, if you try to do any sort of sculpting in dreams, um, then you'll know uh, how amazing this is as an achievement and how difficult it is to create realistic looking things. And this is super real. If this was an advert for this power tool, you wouldn't be surprised. Right, okay, let's remix it and have a look and see what the ins and outs are. Right, first thing to look at is the thermo. So, uh, this is not an asset. Let's um, let's be clear. This is a sculpture. This is meant to be looked at. It's not meant to be picked up and waved around by um, some madman. It's, uh, it is meant uh, just to be looked at. It's not an asset. Um, I don't think you'd be able to optimise this up and use it as uh, an asset effectively because uh, 73 percent graphics is incredibly high um for a a prop in a game I, I wouldn't you wouldn't be able to put very much more in terms of scenery and stuff in if you was to try and use this um so it is a sculpt let's um let's leave it at that um interesting though uh, there's not an awful lot of gameplay thermo being used in here so it's not uh, a lot of um multiple cloning and grouping going on um that would affect the gameplay so this um although it's very high in graphics in terms of gameplay thermo it's it's pretty good so um if you could optimize it down um i think you would lose an awful lot of the detail and you'd be better off just making a new prop um there are two different types of sculptors in dreams there are those that make these amazing um visual feasts um, and they are, um, they're not thinking of thermo particularly because it doesn't matter. And then they're the asset creators who try and keep their thermo down to below 5% for a prop um, so that it can be used with, with very little effect so that people can have a whole scene and just stick their prop in. Uh, and, and the d level of detail is different between those two types of creators. And I'm not saying that that is... Um, Definitely two different people. It could be the same person. But um, on the whole, you've got people that make assets for people to use and people that make fantastic sculptures. That seems to be the dividing line. This is a fantastic sculpture. Um, and we can only appreciate how wonderful that looks. Now, a lot of how, how this looks is to do with the lighting. And as you can see, there is an awful lot of lights pointing at this chainsaw from every angle. There's also uh, a lot of sun and sky boxes. Now, these are providing uh, light and shadow. It's, um, it's also providing us with this black sky. Um, and um, we've also got gradient effects going on. So let's pop in a gradient effects um, D 
default. There we go. There's our default one. And here is Snags one. Let's have a look, see what the difference is. So um, he's changed the brightness. He's moved that right down. And saturation is up a bit. Um, this is all the same. He's uh, up the vignette strength and the bloom and reduce the lens flare down and sharpened it's it's uh at minus 64 uh motion blur has stayed the same this is all the same and that's all the same so there's no glitch effects or anything like that on it so um there's a few little changes to uh the gradient effects and uh, that just makes this just slightly darker really <laughs> and sharpens everything up a bit um, so that you can uh, see the realism uh, there is a timeline here this has got all the cameras in um, they are individual cameras and there's quite a few of them and they've been put in this timeline so they will just swap from each and this will be a looped timeline I'm sure yeah so it will just go around in a circle with all those different uh, cameras. Um, if you're going to make an animation and you're going to use um, the same camera angle um, in multiple times, this uh, copying and pasting uh, the camera gadget is, is actually not the way to go. I would recommend using a keyframe that's powering on the, the uh, cameras. So you place your cameras where you want them to be and then use a keyframe like this um, there we go the same length as your camera and then you just power on so this is powered off normally you just power on um, the the camera press record and then uh, this is your camera now you name that and then you can copy and copy that keyframe over and over again and you're not creating a brand new camera gadget in your world because um, it can get a bit crowded if you've got lots and lots and lots of cameras. So um, using keyframes is a good idea. This is fine though, uh, because these are cameras that go from one to the other in a loop. And they've only been used once. So um, that works nicely. So if you're wondering how to do um, different cameras, that's how you do it with the timeline. Um, the lights are mostly spotlights. Uh, there is, I think one yeah one here that is not spotlight that is um a diffuse light is it it's a bit hard to tell uh but mostly it's uh the spotlights down on there and like i say we've got all these sun and sky gadgets now these sun and sky gadgets are actually doing different things so at the bottom here uh there's three sun and sky gadgets one that's got a, a yellow sun and two that have got blue and um the way that these are being used are different so this is giving us a highlight and this one is creating a shadow um it's a bit hard to see because it is incredibly subtle but if we turn off the power on that one you can see it's actually like i say it's very hard to see because it is very very subtle that's making a difference to the lighting on that, on there. Uh, this one, this is actually providing shadow. And so is this one. It's putting shadow on our, uh, on our creation here. So you can use multiple sun and sky boxes. And um, it's, it's quite interesting how, um, the, the effects are different and of course you've got your sun position in different positions on each of these providing a slightly different angle of the light on our object and you can use it to highlight little areas or make little areas darker uh, that's how you would do it um i must say that's a that's a new revelation for me i i've only ever put down one sun sky box um the, the blackened sky, the blackness, is to do with the sky brightness. 
Uh, they've all got their brightness down to, to zero. That gives you your pitch black. Um, I do not recommend sculpting in your preferred uh, pitch blackness. Um, it's not a good idea to sculpt um, with the lighting effects on. A good idea is to put on studio lighting and then you can um, see all your gadgets. You can see your prop nice and clearly. Obviously, it's not going to look the same as when you put all your lighting effects on, but it's uh, it, you can clearly see what you're doing. Um, it's a good idea to use that tool. And now we've got that tool on, we can see um, there's this huge dialogue text display here. Now, what is this doing? Well, this is providing us with our table. Uh, there we go. We can lower it and you can see, there we go. That is a text box with an opaque uh, gray box. There we go. So we've got a black box and at 54% text opacity. If I move that up, you see that fills it up. We just want it slightly. I think it was 54, wasn't it? There we go. Well, we want it uh, to to give the impression of a reflective surface. And that's how he's done that. Um, there we go. There's our box. Interestingly enough, he's put the letter N in. You don't need to put in a letter. You need to put in something. A space bar will do. Uh, if you don't put anything in this and you just want the shape of the box, it's not going to work. You need to put something in there. Um, but this box is so big that N is not showing up. It's somewhere on that text box, but it's not showing up in the area that we need it to be. So um, it, it works. It's fine. Um, but like I say, you can put in a space bar and that will do just as well. Right, let's have a look. Uh, there's lots of text gadgets on this. Now, um, there are two ways that you can work out the angle of some text. Um, uh, he's chosen to, uh, I think, snap his text displayer to his prop. And that way, uh, when if he lifts his prop up, can I? Oh, no, it's in pieces. Hmm. Maybe they're not snapped. All right, then. Um, these text displayers, uh, he's chosen to um, angle the text displayer in the correct angle to get his text uh, in the right position. Now, that's not how I do it. Um, I would go to uh, this page, put it in scene, which it is, and then allow rotation. And now I, instead of moving the text gadget itself, I move the gizmo. So I can change the angle quite subtly uh, using the gizmo. Um, it also means I can move my text box completely out the way so it's not in the way of where I want to put my text, like so. Now, uh, this does, this, does mean I would recommend you get a microchip, put your text boxes in the microchip, scope the microchip to your object, then use your gizmo to place these things in place. Because if you move the microchip, it's going to move this. Um, so if you want it all so that it's all connected up to your object, put them all in into one microchip, scope, uh, snap that microchip to your prop. Um, rather than having all the separate um, text displayers everywhere, um, that that was that would be a, a tidier way of doing it. And like I say, turn on the auto rotation so that you can move the gizmo around, and you don't have to move the text display around. And you can have this a long way away, and you've got full reign to see what you're doing. But you can see he's used text everywhere and it looks really fantastic. Um, it's very difficult to get nice crisp text if you're using the spray paint. Um, so using a text box is the best way of, of putting text onto your object because um, that looks crisp and lovely. Uh, if you were to try and um, recreate that with the spray paint and spray that on there, 
um, you're not going to get anywhere near a good as a result because you're not going to get nice and crisp. Same with the paint. If you was to try and paint it, um, you have to be extremely good with the paint tool in order to get it to look that crisp and nice. So um, the text gadget is probably the way to go. Um, he has used the spray paint to make this sign. And as you can see, it's a little blurry, but it doesn't need to be crisp and lovely. Um, because you're seeing it from a distance, it just gives the impression. So that's fine. Um, but everything else is a nice crisp text box. And of course you can change the opacity of that text box um, so that it matches up what you need it to be. So this is a slightly grayed out version and upside down over here. And you can do that with the text box, have the text upside down, back to front. And that is because um, this is the, um, the the shadow effect. Now this is a separate sculpt. Um, it's now I there are two ways of doing this. You could have either he could have either sculpted with a mirror, so that at, when he made this part of it, he was also cloning and making this part at the same time. Though I think, um, and this is the way I would have done it. I, you make your sculpt. Uh, in 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 full and then clone it flip it and then stick it in um both ways are legitimate having said that these are all in bits i don't think if i yeah these are all in bits so i think he's made that with a mirror he's always intended it to have a duplicate down the bottom here and so that's how it, that it's been done it's been sculpted on the mirror um that makes life a lot more difficult because then you can't make it in bits and pull the bits in. So I don't know. Um, he might have cloned and then uncloned. That's um, a grouped and then ungrouped. He might have done that. It's hard to say. <laughs> but um, like I say, no reflections in dreams. You have to fake it. So that is a clone of this chainsaw. Right, let's have a look at the chainsaw itself, shall we? Uh, so it is in bits. So the chainsaw part is grouped together as one whole chainsaw, uh, but not without the not not with the text. Um, and then I scope in again. I get blades and I get the the chain. Scope in again. Um, there's an extra piece there. Uh, scope in again and I get both pieces so th this um, chainsaw has two pieces one with a tooth and one without um, and these are made up if I scope in again these are made up of separate shapes so there's flattened cylinders cylinders rectangles there's cut shapes simple shapes and um, they, they've used um, They've also used uh, pieces with um, such as the cylinder here and they've used it sectional with the hole so you get that sort of a shape. Um, then you reduce it down like this and then you get these sort of shapes. Um, so don't think you have to um, cut everything in order to make these sort of shapes. Sometimes it's a, they're available to you. So I think that is what he's done there. And then cut it. There you go. Things like that. There we are. That makes a really nice shape. That's the way to do that sort of thing. Okay. Let's go back, 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 back. Okay. Um, so that's the chainsaw piece. The um, This is a... Um, two piece so you've got the back and the front of that blade part um, and it's made out of a flattened uh, cylinder I think possibly a sphere it's a bit hard to tell um, and then I think that is a stretched out rounded cube to cut out that and um, and then you've got this fantastic 
painting. Now, an awful lot of the realism of this particular sculpt is down to the quality of the spray paint. Uh, it's important to work out where the rust goes, um, whether it goes, you know, goes where, where does the rust and the dirt collect on the object. Um, having really good reference pictures is also very important. Um, this has been made basically like an exploded diagram. Um, there are bits in here that you probably don't see at first glance, but once you start taking it apart, it's like all of these pieces and all of this detail, that makes a huge difference. So you need some really good um, photographic reference or the actual object in front of you and work out um, each of these little bits. And these will all have been made individually. So if I scope in, this part is separate. This part is separate. This part is separate. So they've used they've used this button, the Start New Sculpture button, quite a lot, and that's quite important when you're making a complicated sculpture like this. Use it in tiny pieces. This way, you can change your mind, remove little bits, change the color of them, um, paint them up separately, have different textures on them. Um, don't be tempted to sculpt the whole thing in one go because. Um, uh, it, you don't have the versatility then and if you make a, a mistake and or you ch change your mind about the colouring it makes a big uh, problem for you later on. So uh, make it in lots of little bits and you can use reuse these bits so uh, this um, uh, screw, this um, screw head here um, has been cloned multiple times and put in at different angles in all these lovely holes. You don't have to keep making those screws over and over, you just clone it and pop it in. Um, talking about texture, um, you can see here that the texture of this foam part is different to the metals and the metals are different to each other as well. So there's different textures being used. If I can scope in, um, so that's 24% shininess on that. What about what's this one? That one's only, that's 20% shininess. So that's slightly more matte. Um, what is this like? Uh, I have to scope right in to do that one. Uh, let's have a look at the... There we go. What's this one? 60% shininess on the... Uh, on the wires there on the cable so there we go it's different different pieces have different levels of shininess waxiness um uh different types of looseness etc and most of this is quite tight when it comes to looseness there there there's no need for anything to be fluffy or painterly so um, this is all pretty crisp and the definitions of these are pretty tight, which is why the thermographics are quite high. It, the definition of these pieces are, are quite high in order to get that nice crisp look to them. But like I say, the painting is quite important. Where to put the, the dirt, the scratches, if you look at the scratches on that metal there, uh, that makes a little difference to create realism. Um, this cable's interesting. Um, this has been made out of rings. It isn't one great big long um, uh, piece. Uh, it's rings and part of rings. Might have been done with the curve too, tool, but I have a feeling that might be a ring cut. It's, um, either way, um, you got bits and you put them all together and you create your, your lovely cable. Uh, so it looks like it's one piece when it's lots and lots of pieces. So there we go. Attention to detail, really good reference um, photographs or actual objects so that you get all the detail in. You can see the amount of detail that is put in so you can see it from all angles and all the bits and it's things that you won't even notice at first glance that adds to the realism of this. So um, every single part of this chainsaw has been made. Um, the inside of that engine. It's subtle, but there it is. 
um, the dirt around the, um, the, the 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 rust, all of all of the, the the oil and everything that's on this makes all the difference. And um, the the just putting in that um, shadow adds to the realism of this this presentation. It's a really great sculpt. So I hope you learned some interesting things there. I certainly did. Uh, thank you for watching. If you've got any other props, they've got to be remixable or um, levels or anything that is remixable that I can take apart uh, and see how it was made, then uh, please let me know. And I will see what I can do. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in your dream.